It's time. Hey, let's do it. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly, Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Thank you, Kronk Song. Yes, it is time for Garage Band Weekly. That thing, uh, whether you're on a Mac or an iPad or an iPhone or uh, an iPod Touch, any any iPod Touch users out there, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Welcome to Garage Band Weekly, your one-stop shop for all things Garage Band related. And today, uh, we're brought to you by my Garage Band Beginner's Guide. If you jump on over to studiolivetoday.com slash courses, this one right here, you can pick up the Garage Band Beginner's Guide for just $10. You can't see it, but there it is, just $10. And that's five hours of curated content. If you are new to Garage Band on your iPhone or iPad, it is the quickest way to get up and running and get yourself into GarageBand. Uh, let, let's go with a co-sponsor today and say, uh, if you also want to uh, get some cool merch, you can jump over to the Garage Band, not the Garage Band, the Studio Live Today merch store at studiolivetoday.com slash merch. And the reason I mention that is that I'm wearing my, my classic vintage Garage Band users t-shirt. Now, you can get all the Studio Live Today stuff here, but and I, I have it kind of hidden here, but if we go to... Now, I've got to remember it. Uh, it's studiolivetoday.com slash GBU Dark, I think. <laughs> Should have done this before. GBU Dark. I think that's going to take us there. Uh, the, 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 no, no. Uh, I will get a link and I'll put it in the description at the end of the show. Uh, so you can actually pick these up. And I sell these on the merch store at cost price. So if you're a GarageBand user and you want your very own GarageBand users t-shirt, you can do that. Let's dive into the news and notes because we're nearly two minutes in and we haven't talked about anything iOS 15, iPad OS 15. Let's have a quick update on that in case uh, you have or haven't updated and if you wanted some information about it. So uh, as I've mentioned in previous shows, I've now updated two of my devices. I've updated my iPhone XS. It's been running fine for over a week now and it's 100% cool. I've also updated my iPad Air 2 which is running surprisingly well on iOS 15 or iPad OS 15 iPad Air 2 is the last possible iPad that you can update to iOS, iPad OS 15, and I was a little bit worried. I thought this thing is going to get really laggy, but the good thing about Apple and their newer software and their newer operating systems is it doesn't seem to be that way. You don't seem to go down and degrade performance considerably. Sure, there's not much new, and would, you, would I still bother updating if you're in the middle of a big project? No, and that's what I'm going to reinforce here now, is that until today, today is D-Day for my iPhone 12 Pro. Why? Because I've uh, I finished my song Timber song. Yay! Hooray! And uh, congrats to everyone else who's finished their song Timber projects. So I finished with song Timber, which means my big project that was underway is done. And I can now update. And that's the advice I have for you. The other device that hasn't been updated yet is uh, is this one here, which you can see on the screen, which is the iPad Pro. I've got the 2020 model, not the 2021 M1 edition, but it is still pristine and still runs perfectly. And we'll be using that uh, to do some of our uh, other things later in the show. So my advice right now with iOS and iPad OS 15 is it is working fine for 98% of people who are updating. The one caveat is some of your Focusrite Scarlet gear has had some issues with compatibility and there are still some apps. So if you are relying on a particular app or there's something that you use every day and you're not sure about it, do your research first. Maybe ask around somewhere like the iPad Musician Group or of course a GarageBand Users Group and just find out and make sure before you update because there ain't no going back. Once you're there, you can't go back. All right, uh, the new iPad reviews have started coming out now. So because we've had the new iPads out for a while, and if you're not familiar or if you've missed the last uh, couple of shows, what do we have in, new in the world of iPads? Well, we've got a bunch of stuff. We've got the new iPad mini, which is the, uh, f the, the, the sixth generation of the iPad mini. And we also have, as I reach over here and pick it out out of its box, we also have this. We also have the new iPad. Yes, the original OG iPad has had a refresh. This is the ninth generation. It's running iPad OS 15. It is really nice. And uh, if you hang around the channel this week, you'll see a little bit more information about this baby because I'll be putting it to the test. I was going to demo it here today, and then I realized that there was a small problem, and that is I didn't have my Lightning to USB 3 adapter. I could not find it, so I couldn't actually use this because remember, this one still has your Lightning plug as opposed to USB-C. So things like the Mini, 
the, the one here, the, the brand new mini, is using USB-C. Uh, the new iPad, this one here, is still on Lightning. So it's uh, it's not been updated yet to uh, USB-C, and uh, but it has been updated to 64 gigabytes of storage. So there's uh, a lot going for it, and I'm going to be finding out, is it going to be the best iPad when it comes to GarageBand creating? We'll find that out very soon. The other thing I wanted to talk about here quickly is, uh, guess what? <laughs> yes, our friend over at The Garage Band Guide, the one and only Patrick at The Garage Band Guide. How close is he? 99.7 thousand subscribers. And you know the weird thing? I went there to check this this morning, so I'm like, Patrick's close. You need 300 subscribers. And I'm going to make sure I mention it on the show. And then it's showing that I'm not subscribed. Has anyone else had this lately where you go to a YouTube channel that you were definitely 110% subscribed to and your subscription has somehow fallen off? Now, I don't know if I've accidentally unsubscribed or one of my children did it or logged into my account. I can't imagine that anyone would bother. But yeah, it's weird, isn't it? So we're going to resubscribe. So there you go. My subscription's been added. So now he's... 299. But if you are, as many of you know, many of you know Patrick and you know that he is a fantastic garage band creator and creates some amazing video videos. Um, yeah, no, he's uh, he's nearly there. He's nearly got to the 100,000. And I know we talk about it a lot that vanity metrics aren't exactly what it's all about, but it's a nice recognition. It's a nice recognition for someone who has been working hard at this game for, what, 10 plus years now, I think, for Patrick. Yeah, amazing stuff. So, well done. Uh, Brad's new iPad has USB-C. Yeah, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit because the feature topic here today is going to be the new iPad. Who is it for? Why would you choose it over and above the others? And do you really need it? Do you need the latest and greatest? Because it's an interesting one. Uh, as Jade's saying here, you would think Pete works for Apple. Not with some of the stuff I say, um, because yeah, I, I still am. I'm, I'm fairly critical. I've, I've said that. People are like, "Man, you are so in the in the back pocket of Apple. They must be paying you to say things." I'm like. Uh, if, you, if you think Apple are paying people to say things, you don't know much about them. Even even the biggest Apple fan boys and girls in the world uh, don't get paid by Apple. Apple uh, are renowned for not doing that. They'll give free stuff. They'll let people like Renee Ritchie have demo models of all their things. Renee Ritchie's got like every iPhone and every new iPad, and he's been reviewing those. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. The other uh, big news that I wanted to talk about is that, uh, yeah, this is episode 94, which means we're only six weeks away from episode 100. Yes, episode 100 of GarageBand Weekly. There it is. It's already scheduled there and ready to rock and roll. So that will be live in a mere 41 days. Uh, we'll be doing that at the earlier time to make sure that it's available for the majority of people. So that's going to be at midday Pacific at 3 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. So uh, grab the link there. Look, we'll share it right here in the chat. We'll share the link and uh, you can jump over there. Set yourself a reminder right now. And then in 41 days' time, you can join me for Garage Fan Weekly. Yeah, nearly two years, exactly. It's been going, it's been going a while. We've been doing this, and, uh, and I do thank you folks, because uh, with, without you, a live stream doesn't really work if there's not a cool group of people here in the chat asking questions and participating. Speaking of questions, before we jump into our feature topic here today, if you do have a question, all you need to do is put the word question or at least a big Q in front of your question and that way I'll be able to see that you've asked a question and uh, jump back and answer it. And I did see, I did see a question right here at the start, which is from our friend Jo Glenn and she said, uh, regarding StreamYard, is it best to plug the headphones and mic through the interface, thus bypassing the mic and speakers on the iPad, still be able to communicate with people on the screen? So... Yes and no. StreamYard is pretty good in terms of the browser that you can, with a little kajiggering, use a USB audio interface, depending on the type of interface. The biggest problem you have using an interface with any app on your iPad or iPhone, including your browser, which is what StreamYard uses, is that it's going to put your audio on one side or the other. So if you're using something that's broadcasting stereo and you plug into just the left or the right channel, as our friend Mike over at Creative Source knows from his show, you're going to get mono out. And it's all going to be on one side. Excuse me a moment. I'm very sorry. That's uh, that's just what happens when you're live and you're only a one-person show. Ordinarily, I could say, oh, I'll just I'll throw to my co-host while I have a coughing fit. Um, so yeah, the short version is that the best thing I've found is to just use regular earbuds or headphones that plug into either your headphone jack or if you've got a lightning or a USB-based device, use your dongle. So I use and recommend 
either your regular Apple Dirty Buds. They actually do a pretty good job of being able to do that. Uh, these ones are the, the lightning-based ones, but you can use the regular ones as well, or you can use um, the, the, the JBL Endurance Run, which are the ones that I have in my backpack that I take with me wherever I go, because they just give you a good balance of sound. But I know for your case, you wanted to see if you and Barry could have a headphone splitter and be both on there. You can. The best thing to use for that is a mixer, which I know not everyone has, because a mixer means that you can mix all the channels together and put them both down the middle as opposed to having one left and one right. So it's a bit more of a complex one. Maybe I'll do a, a separate video about options for, for that because, yeah, I know that whenever I do whenever I do interviews and people come on to StreamYard or to any of these uh, restream or these platforms, it can be kind of difficult. Audio seems to be the most difficult thing to get right. The video just comes on. The audio is a bit different. Uh, do, 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 yeah, and StreamYard is for free. Uh, you can use it as, as our friend um, Thomas Christ does. You can use it for uh, 20 hours for free, all for 20 hours per month for free. Uh, the only thing is you'll get a duck in the corner like the one you're seeing just there. I finally learned how to point in the right direction. You've got to point in the opposite direction <laughs> to get that. But it is pretty cool because if you upgrade, you can put like your own logos in the corner and things like that. Uh, but yeah, StreamYard is, uh, is very cool. And I think uh, G-San, uh, yeah, is worth the 20 bucks a month compared to OBS. So yeah, try it. Try it for free. Do what Thomas is doing. Use the free trial. I use the professional version. I like it, but I am also trying Restream as well. So I'm going, I'm moving around and trying a few different things. Uh, we'll just see if you've got any other questions. How long have you been uh, at it on YouTube? Six years now, my friend. So the, a fun thing to do is to go to the channel. Oh, I'll show you this. I've shown this before, and I know many of you know this, but if you ever want to see, if you ever want to see when people created their first video on YouTube, all you need to do is go over to their channel. Oh, look, it's got my, it's updated my, my music over on the side here. That's pretty cool. So when you search Pete Johns, it brings up my channel here, and now it's got my music on the right. Yes. Uh, so if you go to Pete Johns, well, what did I do there? I went to my studio. Uh, so we go to my channel here and go to videos. You can actually uh, come here and sort by and sort by date added oldest. And you can go back to the very first video. So you can see here that the first video that I published on YouTube was the 1st of February, 2016. So what is that, 2021? So yeah, we're coming up to six years. It'll be the six year anniversary on the 1st of February next year. So uh, five and a half years of grinding it out here on YouTube. Uh, I thought I saw one more question there. Uh, question, as a fairly new drummer with a five-piece kit who plays beats, when you use a cowbell, how do you use it to replace the snare or the hi-hat? Yeah, I'm not a drummer, so I'm not really sure, but ting, 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 yeah, cowbell is normally used in replace of like a ride cymbal or a hi-hat or something like that. You probably still want your, your kick and your snare, they're kind of your engine room, but you want to use a, uh, a bell for that. Uh, yes, it is awesome. So StreamYard is pretty cool. Like in terms of being able to give you the ability to try it for free and have most of the features, the features you won't get in the free version is stereo audio. I don't think, unless Thomas can correct me on that, you don't get HD, so you can get 1080p, but 720p is plenty for most people streaming and the green screen, no green screens on the free version. Uh, so there's a few things that you won't get from the uh, the, the free version. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on, shall we? Because we did talk, uh, we did talk very briefly at the start about the fact that I've been testing out the brand new iPad and I thought I would give you a bit of a rundown here of what what's what where, where are we at here if you're a garage band creator and in fact uh, if you're here live let me know your current daily driver what what iPad if you use iPad for garage band what iPad or iPhone do you use for garage band and if you've got any feedback about your particular iPad let's share it here let's share it live and if you're watching on the replay uh, leave your comments down in the description if you've got comments about the iPad that you use because uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to, to sort of unpack here, and that's why I wanted to go through this here today. So, as you may be aware, the first iPad was released like 10 years ago, and it was just one. There was one iPad to rule them all. It had a headphone jack, it had at that stage a 30 pin port, and that was it. Over the life cycle of the iPad, we now have a heap of different iPads, and you can see up the top here, we have the Pro, the Air, the iPad, and the iPad mini. And we have those four different versions are not really in order of their power. So at the moment, the weird thing is that the iPad Pro, as it should be, is the most powerful iPad. So let's talk about that first. The iPad Pro, the 2021 version has the M1 chip, which is the same chip used in the Mac and the Mac Mini and the iMacs and in the MacBooks. And it has eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of RAM, which means it's super overpowered in terms of what it actually needs to do. 
and it is an absolute powerhouse in terms of being able to do everything. So if you're using just GarageBand, and I say just GarageBand, but GarageBand, you know, 32 tracks of full res audio with as many plugins as you want to throw at it, it's going to absolutely crush it. So if you just, if money is not an object and you just want the best possible iPad experience with the best screen, with the best chip, with the best everything, then you want to go for the iPad Pro. But pretty costly, yeah? If we come in here to take a look at the cost of this thing, the base level 11 inch with just 128 gigabytes, which is not enough, is uh, $799. So you'd want to upgrade that and go to at least $256, if not $512. And then you're getting up over $1,000 easily. Yeah. So yeah, you do need to be, uh, you do need to consider if that's something that you actually need. And then of course, if you go for the 12.9 inch, then yeah, you're right up there around, you know, $1,500, depending on how much storage you get, but you get the bang for your buck. Now, until the mini came out, the next step down from that was the iPad Air fourth generation, this sucker right here. And as you can see, it's kind of like a cut down version of the Pro. All in one screen design with the little liquid retina display, 10.9 inches, and uh, it's got all the bells and whistles there. So it uses the Face ID, the A14 Bionic chip. So it's actually you know, using a fairly high end, the, the second most recent chip. You can use the Apple Pencil, you can use the Magic Keyboard. It comes in all the colors. So why would you go for an Air 4? Oh, the other thing is, of course, uh, no headphone jack, but you do get the USB-C. So very similar to the iPad Pro in terms of how you connect just not quite as snappy, not quite as fast, doesn't have the um, the ProMotion display on the screen, so the screen's not quite as crisp and, cr and clear, but in terms of power, it's actually a powerhouse. So anyone that's using an iPad Air 4th Gen will probably tell you that it is a great unit, and uh, again, you can run anything. In terms of GarageBand, in terms of audio, you can do anything, and, and you're getting into with the Air and the Pro, video editing, 4K video, it's gonna eat all of that up. The next contender, Previously with the iPad, but guess what? The iPad mini, and people say, why does the iPad mini get such high-end updates? And it's because it only gets updated about every three, four years. So the last iPad mini, the fifth generation, yeah, that was basically just a little version of the iPad at the time. It had like the A12 processor, I think, from memory, and it really didn't have anything specifically different. Whereas now, the new iPad mini is, as you can see there, it is very much like a cut-down version of that iPad Air 4th gen we were just looking at there. So it has all of the, the same USB-C, it's got the same screen, it's got the same camera, basically, uh, but it has the A15 Bionic chip. So we're at the point now where the mini is faster than the Air and is better performing than the Air. But of course, you're sacrificing the screen size. You're getting 8.3 inches compared to the 10.9. So it is gonna be, it is gonna be smaller, but a lot of people want that. The other thing is though, that the, the difference between this 8.3 inches and 6.1 inches, it's not very big, uh, two inches, it's big sometimes, but no, in terms of an iPad, it's not really going to, to, to be that much bigger. So if you, uh, like me, have the big chunky fingers, the iPad mini, despite the fact that it's very powerful, is not really going to be what you're, you're looking for. The other thing is that when you start looking at cost, if we come in here to buy this sucker, it's only in 64 and 256. Now, if you're buying a device like this, 499 for 64 gigabytes, you're probably going to run out of storage pretty darn quickly. So I almost say it's if you're going to spend $500, you kind of have to spend the extra and actually get the uh, the, the 256, which is going to set you back. Oh, they don't make it. There it is, a 649. So at 650 clams, you're now at the point where if you were looking at even like an entry-level iPad Pro or the iPad Air, kind of comparative. And don't forget with all of this stuff that buying a second-hand iPad, and if you're going to do that, I recommend using my gear guide or using the affiliate links down below. You can go to Amazon or eBay using the affiliate links and search for iPads there. That way, you'll uh, if you make a purchase, they break off a chunk and send it to, to the channel. That's a cool thing to do. Uh, but yeah, at this point, you can get the last version of all these because guess what? The iPad Pro 2020 is still amazing. It's my daily driver. It's great. The iPad Pro 2018 Jade Star uses it. A lot of people still use it. That still crushes everything. There's, that still does everything you need in terms of GarageBand in particular. And then the same with the iPad Air. Obviously, the iPad Air fourth generation is pretty old now, so you can pick those up because some people might be updating to the Pro. And the same with the iPad Mini. The iPad Mini fifth gen will still run iOS 15 or iPad OS 15. So 
In terms of getting yourself last year's model, there's a lot of good deals. The more new iPads Apple push out there, the more refurbished models there are because people are trading them in on the new ones. But let's cut to the uh, to the final point here, which is this one here, the iPad, iPad, <laughs> because their naming conventions are just so weird. The regular iPad here, this thing is like every iPad. So this is the closest to the original iPad in terms of its design. We'll just come over here so I can take a look. Where's my mouse? There we are. Uh, so this is the, the most similar in terms of the normal design. And for, for those that are more the classic kind of users, this one has your home button at the bottom. So you can use your regular tapping of your home button and do that. It's got the basic camera in the corner there, which some people don't love. It's got your normal power button at the top there. It's got your, um, your volume controls there. And it uses, of course, the lightning connector. Only got the two speakers here on the bottom. So that someone, if you, you know, if you're using something with a lot of audio, but you know what, audio people are not going to use that. And the, the, the one thing that I actually like is we've got a headphone jack. Now, I know that's not the bill and end all. You can dongle it up. You can use your dongles. You can adapt things. But the thing is, if you are out and about and you just want to plug in a set of headphones and listen to a mix, I found this the problem with my, um, my song, Timber song. I was out and about and I had my iPad Pro and I just wanted to listen to it. But to do that, I'd have to find my USB-C dongle or I'd have to plug in an audio interface and then plug headphones into that. Just having a straight headphone jack, still a pretty good thing. <laughs> and the other weird thing that I, I kind of didn't even realize, because when I opened this box, I'm like, oh, there's more stuff in here. What's going on? And you actually get, you actually get a charger and a charger cable and the big chunkers, 20 watt, 20 watt or 30 watt, the bigger one, the, the better charging brick here with the USB-C connection and a USB to uh, USB-C to lightning cable here to make sure that you can plug and charge, which sounds stupid that that's a feature because you should just get it. But if you've bought a new iPhone lately, they just assume that you have everything. That's, uh, it's a bit weird. Uh, so, so that is the iPad. The, the good thing about this is that it has been updated in terms of the size. So 64 gigabytes is okay if you're going with something like this. And the A13 chip, I've been finding it absolutely fine so far in terms of GarageBand experience. No, at no point has it lagged. And look, I've, I'm still using an iPad Air 2, and that's starting to show its age because that's the old A9 processor. That compared to this thing, the A13 processor on the new iPad, absolutely crushes it. So is it the is it going to be the be all and end all and the bee's knees when it comes to GarageBand on iPad? Yeah, I kind of think it's that happy medium right now that if you're going to go out and you just want to buy something for $329, you can just pick yourself up the iPad and you really can't go wrong. And these things will hold their value pretty well as well because they're, they're pretty solid and they just do everything you need to do. So keep that in mind if you are going to buy an iPad. And uh, the other thing is I do have my iPad user's guide. Uh, if we go over to studiolivetoday.com slash iPad, it is a work in progress at the moment, pun intended. Uh, so I am up updating some of this information through the week. And uh, if you're a patron, you'll get to see me do it all live. I couldn't. Siri. Uh, yeah, so I'll be doing that on the Patreon page during the week, and then I'll share all of that over here once it's all done. So we've updated with my recommendation. This is just all the stuff I've been talking about now. Your best all-round iPad, your best budget or kids or entry level, and your best performance. And you can search for your iPads there. And uh, the comparison chart there is in the final processes of being completed. And then that will be all updated over at studiolivetoday.com slash iPad. All right. Now, I asked a while ago what, uh, what iPad spokes are using, and then I didn't come back to them. So we'll, uh, we'll scroll on back and we'll find... Do -do 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 -do. There we are. So Gregory O'Sullivan just upgraded from iPad 3 to iPad Pro 2021. Pro is a beast, renders video faster than my gaming PC. Yeah. If you're into video and you're using something like LumaFusion, it's ridiculous. Like I, I'm the same, Greg. I went from a PC running, uh, not Final Cut, running um, uh, Premiere Pro. And then I went to my iPhone at the time. In fact, it was this one. It was the iPhone XS. And LumaFusion rendered uh, 1080p and even 4K about three or four times faster than my PC uh, using uh, Premiere Pro. It's ridiculous. And the quality is fantastic. Uh, hello to Solrak. Hello to Kim. Uh, iPad Pro or Mac Mini. Yeah, what would you get? If you if you had one choice, what would you get between an, something like an iPad Pro or a Mac? I guess it really depends on portability and it really depends on whether touch screen is what you need. So they're kind of the two things is do you need to be portable? In which case you could go a MacBook or you could go a an iPad. But more importantly is if you are more at home with a touch screen than a mouse and keyboard, 
then iPad Pro is where it's at. And the iPad Pro with the Magic Keyboard pretty much is one of those anymore. Uh, next one, so Joe Glenn, iPad 12, 9, third gen, iPad 65, I can't update my present video for lack of space. Yeah, that, that's the problem. When you only have the 64 gigabytes of space, that it can be a bit of a hamstring. You're constantly sort of offloading stuff, which we're, I'm going to show you something in the tips here today that may actually help you with that as well. Hello, Frigzy. Hello, Russ. Hello. <laughs> Hello, a lot of folks who've jumped on in here. I uh, hope you are all doing well. Uh, we'll get to our next section in just a moment. Rick List, the iPad. iPad, yes. Uh, Jeff Brush has the iP iPad uh, 2018 Pro. Yeah. And, and to give you an idea, the iPad 2018 Pro actually like a really good thing so if we come over here like i've gone back to my my gear guide and uh, i've clicked on the the search on ebay button here and if we just go ipad pro 2018 there's some really good deals that you can get on some of these some of these uh, older ipad pro uh, 2018 models like for for 400 bucks this is australian dollars 400 450 uh, 600 for something with more more uh, look at that that's a pretty good deal 660 dollars is the bid at the moment for that iPad Pro 2018 third gen bundle, Wi-Fi, you got all the gear, the Magic Keyboard. That's pretty cool. So um, don't don't dispel that. And if you buy, eBay's okay. eBay does all right. with uh, If you pay through PayPal and things like that, you get good protection. Amazon is good in terms of returns. So you can definitely protect yourself if you're buying secondhand. If you buy it from a bloke down the pub, you kind of not covered. And things like Craigslist and Gumtree little bit iffier because you don't know if it, the, the iPad could have had a history of, you know, going for a swim in the toilet or something. iPads can't really fit in the toilet, not like iPhones, but it may have water damage inside. It may have had a, a cracked screen that's been replaced by some dodgy third party. You don't know. So you buyer beware when it comes to that. But if you're buying secondhand from a reputable place, then you're probably going to be okay. Uh, yes. Some of the best music I've heard made on GB iOS, although I'm a Logic user, personal choice. Yeah. And that's the thing, you, you, can, you can't run logic. So it's probably the, the final thing I'll mention here about iPads right now is even though the iPad Pro new version, 2021, new, newish, uh, does have the M1 chip, it can't run Mac OS and it can't run Mac apps. And by the same token, even though the, I, even though the Mac mini and MacBook and iMac run the same M1 chip, they can technically support iOS apps and they do things like the uh, LumaFusion runs really well on the Mac. I've been using LumaFusion on the Mac mini here a lot more because it's actually really convenient. It, they don't run all the apps, especially Apple apps. So GarageBand that we kind of had a hope that maybe I could just run GarageBand iOS on my, on my Mac here. It would be great to be able to, instead of having to do what I do here, which is screen share my, my iPad screen, I would love to be able to just bring up GarageBand iOS on my Mac. And I don't know why I thought that that would be a possibility, but yeah, it's not. It's not. Uh, all right, we'll see if we've got any final questions. Uh, no, I think we're good. I think we've caught up. If you do have any other questions as we go through, just put the word question in front of your question and we'll try to answer those questions as we go on through. I know GarageBand iOS on Mac would be glorious indeed. I mean, I know that the touchscreen, the interface will be slightly different, but yeah, uh, Wider works on MacBook. Yeah, I think there's even a version of Wider for Mac anyway. So I think you can download the, the Wider plugin as opposed to the, uh, the iOS version. Can you use Logic on an iPad? No, you can't. <laughs> and that's probably the other big, uh, big million dollar question that people were asking. Like, when is Logic Pro going to come for the iPad? And the longer we wait for it, and the more GarageBand continues to get updates, I'm kind of thinking it won't. I'm thinking that Logic on an iPad is not coming. I know that that's going to make a lot of people disappointed, but I think it's just uh, the reality of it. All right, let's jump in to my, uh, my rant of the week. And this is inspired by the fact that uh, if you haven't caught the news, the European Union are at it again. No, they're actually trying to do something good, which is they're trying to create a single standard of connections. And they're going with USB-C. Now, as you know, the newest iPads, now three of the iPads are using USB-C. So the only iPad now that is using Lightning is this one, the original OG iPad. So what does that mean? Well, it means that for creators using iPads and using GarageBand, the old days of the Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter, I mean, those that have been around here know that for nearly six years, I've been saying, you need to buy a genuine Apple Lightning to USB, -C, USB 3 adapter if you're going to plug in your iPad or your iPhone into USB gear. 
You also need yourself a powered USB hub. And I have daily, if not hourly, arguments, not arguments, but discussions <laughs> with folks who are in the comments of every video where I mention this. And they're like, Pete, I went on to eBay and I bought this adapter for $10 and then I plugged in my Focusrite Scarlet and now it won't work. I'm like, do you have a powered USB hub? What's that? Okay, get yourself a powered USB hub. Pete, I got a powered USB hub and my adapter won't work because it's saying this device uses too much power. What's going on? Are you using a genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter? No, it's this thing I got on Amazon for 10 bucks. It's not going to work. And I know that people don't want to hear that because the reality of it is should be that, hey, if you get a thing that's the right size that plugs into the other thing, it should just work, yeah? But in the world of connections these days, it doesn't work that way. So not all Lightning things are created equal because the genuine ones are MFI, which is made for iPad, the old Apple standard, which means they've got a chip in them. And that chip means that it can actually be updated and changed over time. The firmware can be updated and it's always going to work with iOS. The cheaper ones don't. So even the ones that may work today on your Lightning devices may not work tomorrow. And especially if you're updating from iOS 14 to 15, guess what's going to happen? It's going to brick a whole lot of those third-party devices that haven't been made for iOS or made for iPod they're not going to work. So I say all that to say buyer beware because you are going to get what you pay for. And unfortunately, I know it, I don't like it any more than you do. And I'm not talking to you, but the, the mythical you who doesn't listen to my advice. I don't like it any more than those people do because you should be able to just do it. You should be, oh, I'm, try, I'm trying, I'm searching in the background here for my USB guide. If you go to studiolivetoday.com slash USB, it'll actually take you to my USB guide. And what I do need to do here is update this for USB-C because this was created like over a year ago where every iOS device, well, not every, but everything but the one set of pros, the 2018, 2020 Pro, they were the only ones that had USB-C. Now, the Mini's got it, the, Apple, the iPad Air 4's got it, and uh, we have a lot more of people needing that. But if you want to, uh, to find out all about the Lightning to USB 3 adapter and why it's actually important and how it actually works and how you hook it up, as well as my review of USB drives, USB audio interfaces, and the all-important powered hubs and why you need a USB powered hub, then you can jump over studiolivetoday.com slash USB. And that's where I send folks who come in and uh, come in and ask the questions. Now, USB-C. So I mentioned at the very start there that the European Union want Apple and everyone to play nicely and all put USB-C on their devices. And I was listening to MacBreak Weekly this week and it was interesting because they were saying that um, Apple don't have any interest in updating to having USB-C on their iPhones. You might have thought, isn't it weird that we've been through the iPhone 10, 11, 12, and now 13 of the last five years, and they keep adding the lightning jack. Through those, so from the uh, iPhone 11 on, when the 2018, 2018 iPad Pro came out with USB-C, a lot of the pundits were saying, right, the 11 or the 12 or the 13, it's definitely going to have USB-C. And the speculation is the reason that they haven't changed is because there's so many lightning accessories they charge other manufacturers. So if Belkin want to make something that is actually made for iPod and has all the standards, they charge them a, a, a abundant amounts of cash to actually add that to their devices. So that's sort of the main thing. But I really think that for Apple, every little expense that they make around changing things and around updating ports and around having different things, they have to factor that in. And if they don't have to do it, they're not going to do it. And the other part of that is that, guess what? The big rumor right now is that Apple are planning to make a portless iPhone. So why would they go into all of the effort of re-engineering the entire chipset to run using USB-C as opposed to Lightning? Because they are quite different standards when they're planning to remove the ports entirely. And before you freak out about the removal of ports, the... There is still going to be some way. They, they realize that they would be doing themselves a big disservice if there was no way to connect things. So what we're hearing again from the people in the know is that there'll be something like the smart connector. So if you've got a newer iPad, you'll know that it has either these little dots down here that are the smart connector. The same with um, my iPad Pro here. This connects to my Magic Keyboard and other devices by just, chook, just sticking it to there. And that's how it connects there because it's got the little smart connectors on the back. So we're going to see a portless phone 
but it may have the ability to smart connect to like a dock that then might be able to connect out to USB-C. And that may be just how Apple get around this. They'll say, of course you can connect it and charge it using USB-C. You just need to buy our optional MagSafe smart connector dock bundle for another $150 and then you can use USB-C to the cows come home. The funniest thing that I heard though was that, that um, what, they, what they're saying is that the European Union might say, well, Apple, you can keep your lightning. You just have to add USB-C as well. <laughs> How funny would that be if you had an iPhone that had both Lightning and USB-C at the bottom? I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, yeah, let, let me know your thoughts on this. Because I, I think it's kind of a fascinating world at the moment. Uh, the, the sad thing is that for us as the end, end users, it's just a bit of a pain in the ass. Like it would be great if we could just have the one standard and that everything would be USB-C and that everyone can, because the cool thing about USB-C is that I can use anything. Like I've got a bunch of different USB-C dongles and connectors and hubs and everything down here in the drawer. I'm just trying to find them. So like I've got I've got different things here from like cable creation. Who have this one here that has like the the USB C, a bunch of USB ports, a card reader, everything there. I've got this one from a Toller, which is a very basic, just four port USB to USB C hub. And I've got the one that I'm using at the moment, which has um yeah has HDMI and VGA as well as USB C and USB, and that that works really well with my iPad Pro. So the sooner we can get to all USB C, the better. But for now, we're kind of in this limbo in between land. There we go. Uh, we'll see what uh, folks have to say here. Uh, I'll just see if there's any other questions. Uh, Frigzy says, I bought the only micro USB adapter that I could find. Piece of crap. 10, 10 euros on Amazon. It's fine for charging, but killed all the effects from my mixing desk on live streams. Yeah, and unfortunately, when it comes to cables, I've learned the hard way. Like I've, I've, I've got a drawer here full of crap. Like Don't get me wrong. I've tried. I've, I've tried to skip, scrimp and save so that you don't have to. Where's... I, was, I saw it here this morning. When I was looking for another device, yeah, I found things like this, like an old 30 pin to lightning adapter. That doesn't work at all. Um, I can't find it here now. But yeah, there was a, there, there's a bunch of things that I've gone through over time that are just the worst quality and it's, it's not worth it. Don't, don't subject yourself to it. <clears throat> so let's continue. Uh, da, 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 da. DJ Normal Norman says a cheap secondhand iPad is fine to start uh, and end if you really like to get something new. Like, yeah, exactly. Just just get in there and, and try it. Uh, isn't the Mac Mini USB C? Yes, yes. So Mac Mini does have USB and USB C ports. So it's got two USB C and two USB ports. If you're like me, you also have a powered hub connected because I've got way too many USB C things to 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 add. Um, uh, the, the, the Thomas Christ says, I'm doubtful they're going to have portless iPhones, but it's possible. I'm honestly surprised they didn't go USB-C on the iPhone Pro 13s. Yeah. And what it may be is that perhaps we'll get, uh, the iPhone mini and the iPhone, like, so they, say there's the iPhone 14 and the iPhone 14 mini, and then the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max. They could go, let's, let's put the portless on the consumer models and then have USB-C on the larger models, because that would align their pro stuff with the pro stuff, and then it would align their um their their smaller stuff with hey we don't want we don't want cables, it's like roads where we're going we don't need roads. Well, uh, Apple are like we don't need cables because they don't. If it was uh, if it was up to Apple, yeah, you, you, it would just be one piece of glass and with nothing on there except for a, a ridiculously shaped camera array on the back and a notch because you always got to have a notch. Uh, which mic is recommended to record a guitar amp? Uh, yeah, so Shure SM57 or 58 are definitely great go-to mics. What I use on guitar amps is this one here. This is the uh, AKG D5. So it's very, very similar to, uh, to an SM57 or an SM58. You've got the grill on the top there. It's a dynamic, uh, dynamic mic. It is built like a tank and it is super solid. So yeah, if you jump over to the gear guide at studiolivetoday.com slash gear over here, uh, down, go down to microphones, doo -doo 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 -doo. there they all are. So yeah, either of, uh, cause I use both. I've got the Shure SM57, but I've also got this one, the AKG D5. And the reason I like this one is that because it's got the grill on there, you can use this as a vocal mic and sing like straight into it. But it also is super directional because it's got the, uh, the super cardioid, which means that you can point it at stuff and then you can just angle it and get the best possible response for whatever you're recording. The one thing to keep in mind with a dynamic mic compared to a condenser mic is that you won't get 
the um, you won't get as much gain coming through this. So I had someone contact me recently and they were trying to record their, I think their daughter's vocal, and they had to turn the gain up so loud because they were using a dynamic mic that it was starting to hiss. You're getting a lot of room sound. So if you're recording quieter sources, like like really quiet instruments or quiet vocals, then you may want to go for a, a um, condenser mic instead of a dynamic mic. And uh, there's examples of those here on the gear guide as well. So um, the, the one that I recommend and use is this one. One, the Audio Technica AT2020. As you can see, all these mics are around $100. And to be really honest, there, the, who asked the original question, if you buy anything from AKG or Shaw or Audio Technica that's around the $100 mark, you're really not going to go wrong. Whether it's an SM57 or 58, an AKG D5, an Audio Technica 2020 or 2030, they're all going to be high quality. Where you're going to struggle is don't buy, don't, again, it sounds like I keep saying, spend lots of money. I don't mean it like that. If you want to go and buy like one of the $20 or $30 eBay mics, they'll do the job. But what you'll hear is you'll get a lot of background noise, they won't have a lot of gain going through, and they won't be a super clean sound. If you want the best quality sound for your recordings, then around that $80 to $100 mark is kind of where you need to go in terms of a microphone. You'll, you'll get the best quality. Same with headphones. The reason I use these, the Sennheiser HD280s, is that they're the best bang for your buck in terms of they're not going to cost you. They're not $500 mic, uh, headphones, but the $30 headphones that, that I've tried just don't give you the sound response that, that I need. So that's my recommendation. Uh, yeah, for both vocals and amps, the, the AKG D5. Uh, I, I reckon it's, it's the best value, and uh, I've had mine for four or five years, and it has not missed a beat. It is amazing. Uh, hello, the Fit Gamer Dad. Something that I need to work on. I uh, just wanted to thank you for the 100th time for being such a blessing to the community and bringing so much value. I've learned so much from you. Well, thank you, my friend. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, the, the other one here from Tom. Uh, Tom's got another suggestion here, which is one that I've used in the past. I've actually, so what, what I do is I, I pay it forward with my microphone. So I used this pack here, the MXL 550 and 551. This pack here, you get the best of both worlds. You get a small diaphragm condenser and a large diaphragm condenser. Uh, it doesn't have the cost there, but these, this pack's usually about 70 or 80 bucks. And uh, that's another good option there. It comes in a little kit like that. And you can use the small diaphragm one, which is great for miking up your, your amps and your cabs. And then this one's great for your vocals. So yeah, it's another, another excellent suggestion there from Tom. Uh, and yeah, I actually passed this on to my wife's cousin because he's getting into recording. He's a drummer, but he's getting into recording more uh, guitars and acoustic stuff. So um, I, uh, I passed that one on and hopefully it's, uh, it's now getting used for, for some more recording. So that was a bit of a long ranty way to talk about lightning versus USB-C. Uh, if you've got comments and you're watching on the replay, drop them down below. I'd love to uh, hear what you think about this. And would you, would you buy, would you actually have a portless iPhone? Am I the only one going, this is a terrible idea and I want a port? Or from a consumer point of view, if you're not actually making music with your iPhone, would just charging via wireless. They would really have to improve the wireless charging standard because if you use a Qi charger, and look, I do, which are those wireless chargers that you just drop your phone on and they start charging, the actual efficiency of that, um, my background was in um, working for an energy company, so the efficiency of wireless charging is still about a half, if not a third, of the efficiency of actually plugging in. Because if you notice that when you're using a Qi charger, your phone actually gets quite hot. And as you probably are aware, heat energy escaping is actually meaning that that energy is not going into the battery it's going into the actual phone and into the phone case and it's escaping as well it's coming out as heat energy so until wireless charging actually gets somewhere near actual charging what it's going to mean is that you're going to spend twice as much money people don't think about how much it costs to actually charge your devices because it's nothing compared to like a, a radiator or a refrigerator or an air conditioner but the more devices we get and the more inefficient charging methods we have like wireless, then the more energy it's going to use, which is obviously environmental impact, but it also impacts you and your top pocket because you're going to spend more on your energy bills. And you know what's not getting cheaper? Energy bills. <laughs> um, I don't want a portless phone. No. There you go. Uh, MXL 990s are also being uh, being suggested here. And Tom says, I have three of the 990s. I love them. Yeah, MXL makes some good stuff. Uh, and Tom also doesn't want a portless iPhone. Yeah, no, I don't think I want a portless iPhone anytime soon. All righty, should we get into some practical? That was a lot of talking and a lot of ranting. I think we need to get into some 
practicalities. So let's jump on over to the iPad because our plugin or app of the week here. Now, I'm, I'm showing this and I've showed this a heap of times before. But the reason that I want to show this today is that I think there's a lot of folks who have been, who've joined the channel recently who have just got into producing on iOS and you would probably be aware that there's a very cool app called Audio Share. I show this every time I do anything. It's like a $4 app. It's basically a must buy. If you're going to produce audio on your iPhone or your iPad, just buy Audio Share. Why? Because it's got a really high quality audio recorder. If you heard the uh, the interview I did with John on the sound uh, on the song surfing podcast recently, guess what? I recorded that all right here in Audio Share because I could come in here, I could say, "All right, John, what are you recording at?" And he's like, "24 bit 44.1." I'm like, "Cool." I made sure it was set to mono 24 44.1, no normalization, and then I just hit record. It recorded in pristine quality the entire interview, and then I chucked it over to to the uh, to my um, to him, I, I, I zipped it up and sent it over to him. In fact, it probably is. Is it still in here? It might still be in here from when I recorded it. <laughs> no, I must have put it somewhere else. But the cool thing about this uh, is that we can we can use this for other things as well. So it also has this, which is like the audio clipboard. I don't use that a whole lot. Uh, we have this ability to bring in any file. So this is super handy. You can actually bring in a file. So if you want to edit a file, you can bring it in from here. So you can see here that I've used this to like bring in loops and things. So we'll just bring in this random sound. I can't remember what, what this is. Let's just play it. I don't know why I brought in this weird, that weird gong sound. But anyway, so you can bring in sounds directly into here. And then if I wanted to change it around, I could come in here and I could trim it and I could fade it. It's got a really good converter built into here. So if you need to convert a file, if you bring it in and it's not in the, the file format you want, you can convert it here. You can turn it into a, say, a standard WAV file. Uh, if I wanted to make it a mono file, I can do that. Uh, the mono source, this is really, really handy. So you know how I talked about earlier in the show that if you, if say you're doing a recording through an audio interface, if you ever had this where you accidentally record a stereo, guess what? You can actually make it go mono and say you had a stereo file where all the audio was on the left. You just come in here and say, yep, the mono source is the left. We want it now mono. And then it will convert that. It'll grab the left recording and replicate it, duplicate it out to the right. And you'll get a dual mono file that's all on the middle, which is pretty, pretty darn good. So audio share, you need it. The one thing that I think a lot of people maybe aren't super aware of with Audio Share is this one here, which is your Wi Fi drive. Now, I use this for a heap. Anytime I want to send a file from one iPhone or iPad to another, from my iPhone or my iPad to my Mac, from my iPhone or my iPad to my PC, guess what? I use Wi Fi drive in Audio Share because it is dead simple. I'm going to show you how we do it. So, all we need to do is turn this on. Now, don't, don't bother trying to go to this web address if you're anywhere else because this is on my local network. So what this does is it gives you this web address. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to a blank uh, Chrome tab. That's all I need to do. And I'm going to type this in. I'm going to go 192.168.86.21. And by magic, when we come over to here, check this out. There it is. So that's a replication of everything that we just saw there. So I've got complete access. Everything that I had in here, everything that is in this file here and in these folders here is now right here on my Mac. Or you can do it on the PC as well. And you can do this on an Android tablet. You can do this on your, your iPhone. So if I grab my iPhone, I can do the exact same thing. I can come to my Chrome tab here and I could put it straight in there and go to the exact same thing. So that, in my opinion, is pretty darn cool. Now, how do you download things from here? Well, it's simple. So here's my like final mix mastered version of work in progress. If I wanted to download this to my, my Mac, all I do is hit this button and look at that. It's downloading it right here, right now. It's done. And look how fast that is. Because it's using your own local Wi-Fi network, it is super quick. And if I want to come in here, I'll just show it in the in the finder here. So there it is. And it's it's already it's, it's good to go. We'll open it with a quick time player. We'll give it a spin. And it should GarageBand. play Garage Band Weekly, because I played the wrong file. This one instead. Because we're all just a work in progress. Nobody Pretty cool, yeah? Pretty easy to do. Now, sending things the other way, just as simple. So say I wanted to grab this JPEG, this image here of my Song Timber uh, thumbnail. Well, I just grab this and throw it over here. And look at that. It uploads it immediately. Uh, what's something more useful that I might want to send over there? Uh, so maybe, do I have any audio files in here? 
not really. Uh, what about this? The yeah. So here, so uh, Kronk Song, uh, Mark Kronk Song level sent me this song, Timber Jingle. What if I want to bring this over into GarageBand and play around with it? Let's do that now. Let's do it for fun. All I need to do is drag this over into uh, Audio Share here on my browser, and come on down, and there you go. It has copied that one across. There it is, Song Timber Jingle. It's ready to go. All we need to do now is jump back over here. Uh, get rid of that one. See ya. And we will turn off Wi-Fi Drive now because we've done our copying and come back over to here. And then this is going to have automatically brought that in. Here is Kronk Song's Amazing Jingle. September, September on your music night. So for those that were early pioneers like the Jade Stars of the world, you know how annoying it was. You used to have to connect up using iTunes and then use iTunes file sharing and then it was just an absolute mess. So for $4 to buy audio share and have Wi-Fi drive there and be able to send stuff between all your devices is just super cool. It's amazing. It works better than AirDrop. Like people are like, why do you need that when you got AirDrop? This works better. And the one thing that will, will be relevant to the next thing that we're going to do is you can even use this for GarageBand projects. However, you need to zip them up. And that's going to be our final tip of the week is how do we back up our GarageBand projects? How do we make sure that we don't lose our precious, precious projects? So we will do that in just a moment. But the final thing that I wanted to show here is if we want to now use any of these audio share files that we've converted or sent across here in GarageBand, well, guess what? We can do that easily as well. Let's just go into GarageBand. We'll just create a new idea here in our ideas folder. We'll go to the audio recorder here. We will click in the top left to go to our track view. And what we can do, so we can go to the loop icon up the top right here and we're going to go files and we're going to go browse from the files app now all we need to do the cool thing about audio share is it becomes one of your actual options here if it's not there just come to the top here and uh, edit the sidebar and you can actually add them in here so if that's not on just make sure you add that so it's one of your options here just using that edit sidebar then if we go here look at this everything is right there we want the song timber jingle we tap on that one it's going to import it and in a couple of seconds it flashes that tells us it's done and now we can bring cronk song song timber jingle right into here and check it out song timber, song timber. We can do cool things. We can uh, we can make Mark sing backwards if we want to. Let's do that. Let's reverse it. Come on, Mark, sing it. What is he saying there? Um, I think he's like, "You're amazed, balls." <laughs> You taste nice. Oh, okay. We're we're going to leave it at that. Um, but yeah, so you can do some pretty cool things in here. Let's undo that. All right. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a cool ways to manage your files here using Audio Share and using your iOS and the Wi-Fi drive there for the win. Very very cool. Uh, yeah, maybe it was maybe it was Hail Satan or hurt everyone. <laughs> Did you say hurt everyone? <laughs> All right, uh, we are coming towards the end of the show. So uh, let's let's do our final one. Uh, so Thomas Christ, good question here. Before we do our our final tip here, any benefit to using Audio Share file transfer over iCloud if you have a Mac? Not really. The only benefit, Thomas, that I've found is the instantaneousness of it and the fact that you get to control it. So. The one thing about iCloud Drive, it's, it's a good point. We'll, we'll pause on it because you might be thinking that, hey, if, if, I'm, if, I've got, if I've upgraded my iCloud storage, why would I not just use the Files app? Because that's the other thing that you could obviously do is that if we've got this file here, if it's, just, if it's somewhere on iCloud Drive, everything that's here is replicated everywhere else. So if I'm on a Mac and I just throw something here into my Studio Live Today folder, this stuff is going to be accessible. But what it has to do is it has to actually upload to the cloud. So in terms of speed, if you've got, say, like a four gigabyte file, what that has to actually do is for you to access it on your Mac, you put it into your iCloud drive, it uploads that to the cloud. So it, and it's a good thing because it means that it's backed up. So if you go to your Mac, you have to then wait for it to upload and then download that whole file again. So you're using four gigabytes of upload and then four gigabytes of download on your actual internet connection. What AudioShare does is it goes around your whole internet problem and it sends it direct. So if you want to get something, so for instance, if I'm about to walk out the door, 
I don't want to have to take my phone and then I'm, I'm gone and then I want to download my file. I know that I have to then use my data on my phone to download the file using iCloud Drive. If I send it via audio share, it goes straight into my audio share folder on my phone and then I'm away. And I know that I've got the full version of that file because it's a direct, uh, direct transfer straight from one to the other. So it's a really good question though. Use Dropbox. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, DJ Normal Norman, because what we're going to do here is actually show you how I, uh, how you can back up your GarageBand project. So I'm just going to find my uh, my project here, which is GarageBand iOS. It's Song Timber, and it's the latest version, version 19. So uh, let's let's get ourselves set up and ready to rock and roll. So. If you want to back up your GarageBand projects and not use iCloud Drive, I'm gonna show you how to do that. Now, you can, of course, just use your iCloud Drive and it will automatically back up all your stuff. So here in the iPad or the iPhone, there's two storage locations. One is on my iPad and one is iCloud Drive. Now, anything stored on my iPad here in the GarageBand for iOS folder is not getting backed up anywhere. So I strongly advise against using that one. I would advise you use this, the iCloud Drive folder, anything here in your GarageBand for iOS folder will get backed up. However, that's gonna fill up your iCloud Drive pretty quickly. Now there's options such as the one I use, which is able to upgrade to two terabytes of storage. So all of my files are all stored there. But if you don't have that and you've got limited space, how do you make sure you can back up your files somewhere else? Here's the trick. Unfortunately, GarageBand's GarageBand.band folder uh, file structure is not compatible with things like Google Drive or Dropbox or any of the other cloud storage platforms. It works on our cloud drive, but if you want to use OneDrive, guess what? You are SOL, which as we know means sort of out of luck. But there is a workaround that we can actually use here, and that is to zip up our file. So what I'm in here is I'm in the Files app. Now, the biggest mistake I see folks make is that they go to GarageBand here and they want to try and do it from here. And they're going to go, all right, I'll go in here, I'll do what Pete says. Where's, where's my zip? I don't have the option to zip. I can't compress the file. Well, that's because you're in GarageBand. If you go out and go into your Files app, this one here, then you can do it from here. So what do we need to do? Well, to compress the file, we need to tap and hold on it. And then down the very bottom here, there is Compress. Now there's another option here where we can tap the Select button and we can select a file or multiple files if we wanna compress, say, two different files together. So if I wanted to compress every version of this song, so you can see here I've got 19 versions because I've been creating this song throughout the month. I've got 19 different versions. If I wanted all of those in the one zip file that I can then have a backup of everything, I would do that. But for, for our sake here, we're just gonna do one. So we'll select that one. In the bottom right, there's a More button. We're gonna tap that and we're gonna hit Compress. And what that's gonna do is it's going to zip up that .band project, 291 megabytes of it, and it's going to compress it into a zip file. Now, because it's already using audio, it's not gonna make it super small, but that's not really the point here. There you go, it's, it's still the same size. It's only compressed about 40, 40 megabytes of it. So but the point here is for us to be able to then transfer this somewhere else. Now, the you would think the easy way to do this would be to have your different file structures over here. So for instance, I've got Google Drive over here. You can do the same with OneDrive. You can do the same with Dropbox. They're all here and you can just paste straight in here. So if I wanted to go in and just copy that, I technically can come over here to my, on my, uh, sorry, my iCloud Drive and go to that Song Timber folder, grab this file and drag it on across and say, I would like this in my Google Drive now, please. And release it and it's gonna copy it across. Now that works okay sometimes, but as you can see there, it gets a little bit clunky and you don't really know, is it uploading, is it doing it, is it not? So my recommendation is to actually use the native app. So if you're on Dropbox, use the Dropbox app. If you're on OneDrive, use the OneDrive app. Use whatever the app is. So if we go here and we'll search for it, so we'll scroll down and we'll just go Drive, because I know it's Google Drive, there it is. So if you're on OneDrive or Dropbox, use the exact same process. We load up the actual drive here. Now what I can do is I can come in here and we can actually upload it. And the reason I wanna do this is that I'm gonna actually make this accessible and my patrons are gonna get it today. If you're not a, a member of Patreon here, I will open up access for everyone in about a week's time. But there you go, another incentive to become a patron because I'm gonna let you folks have access to the complete track of uh, my GarageBand project for my song. Timber song. So what I would want to do here is probably create a new folder to start with. So we'll click there, we'll go new folder, 
And we'll call it Song Timbre 2021. And we're going to create that. So we've created the folder there, and then we'll go into that folder. It's empty at the moment. We'll hit the plus button again, which has just moved, and we'll upload. We want to browse, and then we want to go and find that. So we know where we saved it. It was here in iCloud Drive. It was under GarageBand for iOS, under Song Timber, and there it is. There's our zip file. So here you can see we get an actual progress bar, and it will actually show you that that is uploading. So once this is done, guess what? That's saved there. And then we can delete it from everything. Why is this so, so handy? Well, the problem is, uh, we'll let that go in the background. The problem is that using the files app here and using iCloud Drive, if I delete something from my device, it goes away from iCloud Drive as well. iCloud Drive is a weird thing in that if you have it synced with your devices, as soon as you delete something, it deletes it. It's a bit of a flaw in my opinion, but you can work around it because if you use Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive or whatever else, you can just zip up your stuff and then save yourself a copy over there. And then it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you accidentally delete it from your iCloud Drive. If you need space on your devices, if you need more space on our iCloud Drive, you can offload it. And of course, guess what? You can use this to actually send it off to another device. So if we use something like the Wi-Fi drive here in AudioShare, guess what? We can use this to actually transfer those files to our Mac or our PC. So you can just go to a web browser, type in that address, and you can download those directly. And then you can save them to your, your backup drives, save them to your flash drives, save them to your local hard drives. It's a very cool way to back up your GarageBand projects. Let's go back to Drive and see how we're going. <coughs> no thanks, we don't need the new Drive widget. So there it is. It is uh, uploading there, and once that's done, it'll be good to go. And uh, here's one I prepared earlier, just to show you what, what we could then do with it while that's still uploading. So if we come in here to say Murdering Time, this is what I did with the previous one. And what we can do from here, you can see it's already shared, but you can come in here and you can share these files. So I can basically say, look, everyone has access to that one. Anyone who has that link can come in here and download that zip file. And that's what we're going to be doing with this one as well. So there you go. And as Thomas says here, if you want to join the Patreon, Patreon and uh, get access to all of those project files and all the stems and all the goodies underneath, you can do that here today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, got a frog in my throat there. And we are, we're, we're over time already. What's, what is it with me and going over time at the moment? Okay, I'm going to put the call out here to anyone who has any final questions. If you do, then uh, do let me know. Um, Zach B says, intriguing. I may have to investigate this. Not an iOS creator pr primarily, but might be a good tool if I'm on the go to create something. Yeah, and it totally is. It, it's a great tool for being on the go. And GarageBand iOS is just, it, it's getting better and better. It's, it's, it's better all the time. Um, and yeah, if, if, again, if you're asking about why you'd use that over some sort of cloud storage, it just, it literally just cuts out the middleman as Tom, Tom's saying there. So instead of you having to upload to the cloud and then download from the cloud, it's just sending it device to device over your local network. So if you think of it in terms of that, that even if I was disconnected from the internet, I could still use that because it's just on my local area network. So as long as you've got Wi-Fi plugged in and you're on the same Wi-Fi network, even if your internet's down, you can still send files from one device to the other. Think of it like Bluetooth, but much faster. Because the other thing is, of course, you can use Bluetooth, you can use AirDrop, but I find that the audio share option is just so much quicker because there's no other overhead. It's just sending it straight, boom, straight over your Wi-Fi. Works well. Hello, uh, Blind Stitches Creations. I hope you're well. Uh, I'll just uh, see if there's anything <laughs> useful to, to check hidden messages in Beatles songs. Absolutely. Uh, all right, I think we are kind of done here. Uh, oh, here we go. We've got Barry's got a question. Uh, is it being to record an amp with a condenser or a dynamic mic? It's the best. Yeah, so we mentioned that a bit earlier, Barry. So I'd, I'd s s scroll on back. Scroll? Scroll? Scroll on back to um, to when we talked about them before. But dynamic mics are better for louder sources and condenser mics are better for quieter sources. And that's a very big generalization. But if you are, that's why I'd say that something like this, again, I showed this before, but the AKG D5 is a great option if you're recording loud sources. So I actually use this for a lot of my vocals lately. I use it on my, my recent song because we're all just a working. I was singing pretty loudly. If I was doing like a soft, gentle vocal, I'd probably go uh, for the AT2020, a condenser mic. In terms of micing up an amp, the reason that the SM57 or an AKG D5 or an SM58 even is what most people use is that it gives you, it, it 
can take a louder signal. Whereas a condenser microphone is super sensitive. If you are blasting out a loud amplified signal, it's not going to um, it's not going to help you out. Uh, question from Mark: Small mixer with FX and compression. Any suggestions? So I'm sort of in the hunt for this myself, Mark. And funnily enough. I've for a while ago, and just a lot of other things got in the way, but I'll, I'll scroll over, I'll str scroll over here because oh, I was sent, I was sent a while back, and I apologise to uh, Flammer that I've not actually, I've, I did a sort of first look of this one, but I haven't actually been into it in detail. But this one here, the Flammer FM10 mixing console, it seems like it does exactly that. It does have uh, a compressor on the mic channel. I believe, yep, yep, compression. So it does have a compressor on the mic channel. It's a two-channel mixer, uh, and you can mix in. It's actually it's actually six-channel because you've got three, four, and five, six. Uh, so you've got two stereo channels there. You've got two mic channels or instrument channels there, and it looks like it's the goods. I think it's about a one fifty, two hundred dollar mixer. I haven't had the time to actually test it out yet. So that's something I'll, I'll, I'll put this here to remind me to do that because maybe we'll do that over on Patreon this week as well uh, to get familiar with that because I can't recommend it yet because I haven't used it. The the ones that I can recommend are not exactly small, uh, but the Yamaha MG series is probably your best value, your best bang for buck if you are looking for a mixer. If we come over here, We'll go to the gear guide. Again, I don't use one, so I only have on the gear guide the stuff that I recommend. But if we go to the mixers, um, the, the, the Samson mix pad is awesome, but it is not small. <laughs> so it takes off a lot of desk real estate. So uh, yeah, and if it wouldn't, if it wouldn't cost um, probably as much as it's worth to send it to you, because I've got mine that I don't use anymore, Mark, I'd probably send it your way. Uh, but so that, that's a really good, uh, really good mixer. The Behringer stuff I've got mixed reviews about, and I've never used one, so I can't recommend them. Uh, but if you go Yamaha MG, these are kind of the, the home studio industry standard that a lot of folks use, the MG. Uh, this one's the MG10XU. Do they make a smaller one? Yeah, so they make the MG06 um, mixer. Well, that's the analog version. Hang on. You, you can ha have a dig around in your, in your own time. You'd probably want the USB version. Hang on. Back here, was it down here? Uh, MG6, uh, that's, yeah, there's something like this. So anything in the MG series, and I'll just make sure that these do have a compressor on them, because some do and some don't. Uh, maybe that one doesn't. Yeah, so you will have to dig around there. But I, and I know that many folks, so Thomas Christ uses a, an MG series, um, Jade uses an MG series. So if you're looking for, if you're looking for something that's going to have the quality, uh, they, these all use the, the Yamaha d -Pres, which is the same as the Steinberg interfaces use. So you get a good quality, uh, yeah, good quality preamp. And the, the higher end ones do have a compressor on those mic channels. So that should, should help you. Um, I'll just see if anyone's got any final questions before we continue on. Yes, we do. VEL, uh, Pete, I have issues connecting my mic to my iPad. It says it needs too much power, although I've used it before. So that may be, uh, check the gear that you're using. Uh, we did talk about that earlier in the show, but whenever you get an issue with power, it's usually to do with either not having a genuine uh, lightning to USB adapter, so the genuine Apple lightning to USB adapter, and the fact that you said it did work before, but now it doesn't, may be that if you've updated the operating system, it may no longer support that if it's a third party adapter. So that's the first thing to check. Second thing is to make sure you've got enough power going through and that's where a powered USB hub is what I would recommend. So again, both of those are linked over on the gear guide. If you're wondering what the powered USB hub is all about, so let's just go through this real quick. So your Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter is the one that looks like that. It's got the big chungus end there, and you've got, even though it's got a picture of a camera, you can use it for anything. It's got USB and lightning on that end, and lightning on the other end, and the, uh, the powered USB hub down here. So this is the one that I've used for ages, the Tendac powered USB hub, which is this one. It's a $20 hub. It just works. I still use it. It's plugged in. It's what's powering my iRig Pro Duo and my iPad Pro at the moment. So it, it, it works and it just works and has worked for a very long time. And uh, I've been using a lot of Atola gear lately because Atola have actually sent me one of these. And that's what I'm now using on my Mac is this larger, um, larger hub. So yeah, there, there's options there for you. But if it's something like that, it's generally that you want to you wanna get yourself some sort of powered hub and make sure that you're using a, a lightning to USB adapter. Uh, so I recommend the MG10 XU mark. That's what I use. It's great. Not too large. There you go. And uh, I think Jade, yep. Jade seconds that. Absolutely. 
All righty. Uh, cool. I think we are. Uh, I think we're done. I think we can put a fork in this one. So uh, a couple of quick reminders before we go. Make sure you do go and check that you that you're actually subscribed to the Garage Band Guide because <laughs> I wasn't, and I was almost certainly uh, sure that I actually was. But um, yeah, Patrick over at the Garage Band Guide, he is nearly there. He is nearly there at uh, at his uh, one hundred thousand. And again, I've, I've said all the time. The vanity metrics aren't what's important, but it is a pretty good indication that there are a lot of you out there that actually love yourself some GarageBand, that someone can have a channel that is dedicated entirely to GarageBand, and uh, there's enough people there to get 100,000 subscribers. So go and check out Patrick, as if you haven't already, because I know many of you uh, are also supporters of Patrick, which is a great thing. And do not forget, set yourself a reminder right now for GarageBand Weekly episode 100. I've dropped a link right there in the chat so you can go and set a reminder there and in 41 days we'll be coming back. And again, that's going to be at the slightly earlier time. The one final thing I'll say is that there are going to be some time changes over the next couple of weeks. So if you're watching this one, do keep an eye on the channel and do check the times and the schedules for your local area. I'll try to communicate in as many places as I can, but I know that some folks missed some shows over the weekend because Australia went into daylight saving and when I say Australia I mean all states except Queensland because Queensland are a bit different they do things their own way up there <laughs> hey Matt hey Darren yes my Queensland friends uh thank you everyone for being here remember please if you want to support the channel you can go over and check out the Garage Band Beginner's Guide this show was brought to you by the Garage Band iOS Beginner's Guide just ten dollars five hours of curated content it will give you that kickstart in Garage Band on your iPhone or iPad that you need and you'll be supporting me and the channel if you do it so thank you everyone for being here please be kind to yourselves this week I hope you had a great weekend. Please be kind to others because it's super important. I can't, I can't mention how much that you need to uh, look after your community because it's a great community. And keep creating uh, here. All right, let's go out with a little more Kronk song, shall we? Thanks for watching Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Garage Band, Garage Band Weekly. Need an answer to your question? John, do you have a suggestion?